A lot of you seem to be into Dragon Age, and I played that, the first one anyway. So um, let's make some drinks from Dragon Age today on HTD. Dragon Age. Drinks. Drinks. Uh, dra drinking Age. Drinking Age. Age of Drinking. The Age of Dragons. I gotta stop. I just gotta stop. <laughs> Dragon Age. I think that one's pretty popular, right? Either that or Twitter has decided that I personally need to know about it. Every single time someone drops a Dragon Age take or piece of fan art or whatever, I have no idea why. I mean, yes, I did play Origins, but um, I didn't really seem to uh, get bit by that same romance novel posing as video game bug that you all seemed to get bit by. So I, I don't know, I don't know. But a lot of you have been asking me for Dragon Age drinks. Uh, so I did do a little bit of research here to find some more sources for drink inspiration in the series, and I am in luck because Trespasser, the final DLC for Dragon Age Inquisition, there's a note you can find in the Gilded Horn Tavern, and it's a drink menu! This is a weird coincidence that two games from Bioware include detailed lists of drinks in their latest and final DLCs. Huh. Any anyway, normally I would be more selective than this, but I do feel like in this case it just makes sense to make them all. So I've got a lot to get through, let's keep it moving. Up first is the Golden Nug. The Gilded Horn describes this as an effervescent white selenny wine with a dash of West Hill brandy and a splash of pomegranate juice, muddled raspberries, and a sprig of royal elf fruit. I don't know what elf fruit is. Well, I, I mean, I kind of do. It's a herb in the game, but there's not like a description for its flavor profile or anything like that. But I think I'm going to be able to find something suitable for stand-in. Otherwise, that recipe does sound pretty much totally doable. It sounds kind of like a champagne cocktail meets a clover club. Into my shaker, I'm going to drop a few fresh raspberries, like five or six. Clover clubs often, you know, particularly in like their older recipe, they call for raspberry syrup. But if you have fresh raspberries, that's so much the better. Uh, raspberries are filled with juice and uh, don't really need to be muddled if you're going to shake the drink at all, because they'll just give up all of their fruity, juicy goodness. Fruity, juicy goodness. Interesting. It's more than five or six, but that's fine too. Oh, there's tart ones too. I like that. Then I want half an ounce of grenadine. This is my own homemade grenadine. Oh, I bottled it hot, so there's a little bit of suction on the cup there. It's cold now, though. Okay, half an ounce of grenadine. And if you want this recipe, um, I'll put a link to my grenadine episode in the pinned comment below. That recipe stands. It's the same way I've been making grenadine for years and years now. It's just pomegranate juice, pomegranate molasses, a couple drops, maybe more than a little couple drops of orange blossom water, and then the whole thing is mixed two to one with sugar. Um, I need an ounce of cognac. I haven't read anything to suggest that uh, West Hill brandy should be some kind of a fruit brandy or eau de vie, so I think I'm just gonna stick with the cognac here. And I do love a Pierre Ferrand. Pierre Ferrand! I do enjoy a Pierre Ferrand 1840 cognac for cocktails. It's really good for that. It's kind of made for that purpose, actually. These spirits will be available at Curiata, drink.curiata.com. Partner of the show. They deliver to, I think, 30 states, which covers about 80% of the U.S. population. Use the link in the pin comment below, or go to drink.curiata.com to buy any of these things that I'm using in this episode, which there's quite a few of if you want to follow along at home. So as I mentioned before, raspberries don't need to be muddled. You could muddle this, but if your ice is dense and heavy, the shaking is going to do the trick. So I'm going to skip the muddling. I'm just going to throw some ice in my shaker. I'm going to double strain this to make sure I don't have any of this huge amount of raspberry pulp in my drink. And it's going to take a lot of uh, agitation in my shaker to get it all to come out. We're going to top this up with a few ounces of sparkling wine, which is why this glass is perfect. It leaves a lot of room for that. Um, maybe a bit more room than necessary, but I think it'll be fine. Uh, this, by the way, is not champagne. This is some real cheap stuff here. This is Sapori della Vigna from Zucchi. Azienda Cargola Zucchi. Okay. Dry, sparkling white wine. Perfect. I think our elf fruit stand-in is going to be a sprig of rosemary stretched right across the top there. And there we have the golden nug. It's occurring to me now that maybe this should have been golden in color, but the raspberry stuff was called for in the recipe. So, I mean, there's really no way around getting raspberries being red. Oh, that's really nice. The raspberries are a wonderful accompaniment. Accompaniment? The language cortex of my brain is just failing. The the raspberries are a lovely accompaniment to the sparkling wine, actually. It kind of turns it into almost, it tastes like, um, if you've ever had a frambois beer, like a lambic ale, a frambois, tastes a lot like that. The herbal rosemary nose that you get from that garnish actually goes with the raspberry really, really well. Those flavors, that savory fruit tartness and the wine actually really work super well together. The little bit of sweetness we get from the grenadine 
is welcome and not overbearing at all. And the cognac slides right in there and knocks it up into fun territory without really announcing its presence too loudly. This is delicious. I really love the effect of breathing the piney rosemary nose with this fruity cognac cocktail. It is very, um, it's Christmassy, honestly. The combination is kind of Christmassy. It even has a like Christmas kind of color too, that red and green thing. I would, I, I'd love this. I would finish this, not for the fact that I have a whole bunch more drinks to get to in this episode. And let's move right down that list to the Hissing Drake right after this. I didn't see you come in. It's so nice that you're back. So the Hissing Drake. Now that calls in the recipe in the game for a cinnamon infused whiskey which is great because usually you have to kind of decode that stuff from fantasy speak, but they're just like straight up cinnamon infused whiskey, put that in there. Dark Lomarin rum and Hirol's lava burst. Okay, so there we go right off the rails into the territory that I got to admit. I could go the upscale route here and find a nice whiskey and pair it with a cinnamon syrup, but the name being the hissing drake and its evocations of dragons spitting balls of fire I think we gotta go with Fireball. But by the way, I don't think Fireball's appeared on the show before. So here we are, Fireball. It's your How to Drink Premiere. <laughs> so um, the rum, rum is a many splendored thing. And which real world rum is closest to Lumeran? Impossible for me to say because the game doesn't give us tasting notes on what Lumeran rum is like. With that said, my gut tells me to go with Lemon Heart here. Now for Hyrule's Lava Burst, we do get a bit of in-world flavor text that it Tastes like burning. A nice Ralph Wiggum reference. And there's a few ways to interpret that. Often people associate cinnamon with fire, but this drink is already doing the cinnamon thing and it really can't be just another cinnamon liqueur. I suppose it could be a liqueur made from poison berries, but why would it be that? Personally, I think it's spicy. Like for example, some ancho raised chili liqueur. And that's what I'm going with here. It also says that it's not for the faint of stomach or heart. And there's something about that phrase that tells me this drink should either be done as a tiki type thing or as a shooter. I can't quite explain that logic, but I think you probably follow me, right? You get what I'm saying? My next thought is that there's too few ingredients in this for it to really be a tiki drink. So by process of elimination, let's build it as a shooter. So in my shaker, I'm gonna pour half an ounce of lemon heart, blah, 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 blah. Half an ounce of lemon heart. This is the lemon heart 151. One ounce of fireball. The good stuff comes in a plastic jug. Mm. And now I want half an ounce of my ancho rays chili liqueur. We're gonna shake that up with some ice. Now, how to drink doesn't do a lot of shooters. I don't have a shooter glass collection, but I do have this incredibly cool little devil mug from when I made Cafe Brulot on the show. And I thought that's a good chance to use that again. Perfectly appropriate for what we're making here too. Take a cinnamon stick, put that across the top here. Grab a little uh, dragon's fire, right? You know? And, uh, and we have a singed cinnamon stick for a garnish. There's a drink called an old Cuban that I think calls for that. So it sort of looks like a cigar. Here we are, the hissing drake. That's not too, too bad. It is a lot of booze. That, that drink is strong and spicy and peppery and cinnamony. And actually there's a note of bubble gum that shows up in the middle there. The rum actually is super important to this drink. It brings in a baseline kind of bottom note of this sort of heavy demerara thing. Also some, some fruit funk kind of notes, some of those banana notes. It's, but it's not the main event. It's just super important to the foundation of this drink. The main event is the interplay between the chili and the cinnamon, and they work really well together. And, and for sweetness, by the way, Fireball brings quite a bit of sweetness. We don't need a simple or any kind of sugar in this at all. This drink is plenty fine with just the three spirits in there. It's not overpowering. The cinnamon and the ancho rays, the spice, they are like really well paired and just enough. You know, more would be like, <sighs> Be like a torture drink, but you don't want it to be that. You want it to be nice. This is something people, it's on a menu. People want to order this. This is actually pretty nice. And that is my hissing drink. I don't know, my voice is cracking. I'm turning into Ralph Wiggums. Let's move on to the benediction right after this. So next up is the benediction. This is a very short recipe in the game. It's Prophet's Laurel Gin with a wedge of lime and a thimble of golden scythe. I think we can guess what gin is. That sounds pretty familiar at least. But what is Golden Scythe? What's that? My research on the game setting doesn't tell me anything, sadly. I, I was looking at the proportions, it specifies only a thimble. So it could be some kind of an aromatized wine making this drink sort of a martini, but a martini with lime. Well, that's odd. 
Personally, I think Golden Scythe could be also something that's like Drambuie. Lots of flavor and a small proportion, rare and valuable enough to make a nice gift. But, and this is just like my own personal thing, I've already made a drink very similar to that before. I made a Rusty Anchor, a drink that I made as a toast to the Golden Girls, and I don't really see much reason to revisit that combo of gin and Drambui here. But then it hit me, golden or yellow in color. Scythe, as in a harvest load of herbs and botanicals. Why, that's going to be yellow chartreuse. And when I hit upon that, I suddenly felt that this drink had a lot of promise. So I'm gonna get my mixing glass out. I got my mixing glass right here. I'm gonna add to that one and a half ounces of gin. I'm gonna go with Tanqueray. I want to add one ounce of yellow chartreuse. Um, in a simple drink like this, that's only two ingredients, it's great that yellow chartreuse will bring so much to the table. Is an ounce a bit more than a thimble? Uh, it depends on the size of your fingers, you know? Um, maybe a bit more than a thimble, but perhaps in Dragon Age, thimbleful is a term of art, you know? It means something specific. It doesn't literally mean a thimble. I'm gonna crack some ice in there uh, and give this thing a very good stir. I want to get it extremely cold. It's, it's kind of like a crazy martini, so we don't want it to be not cold. Now, I know the instructions say that a wedge of lime should go on here, and we should, you know, honor that and perch a wedge of lime on the rim of this glass, but I'm interested in the idea of actually doing a twist of lime. I think that that'll be more interesting to me. So I'm gonna pull my lime twist, and I'm gonna give that a squeeze over the top of the glass. It's gonna add a lot of bitterness to this, actually. You could drop that right into the glass. You could toss it and still do your lime wedge. I'm on the fence about this. Um, you know what, maybe this is a drink, you know, there's no citrus in it right now. Maybe it is a drink that should get a wedge because maybe it benefits from having a squeeze of lime juice. So we'll do a lime wedge. So there we have the benediction. It does look very pretty, doesn't it? All that, that green hue is very nice. Let's see if it's any good. Mm, it has a powerful lime nose, of course, as you'd expect. Oh my, I like that. I mean, I like chartreuse quite a bit. And here you've got the chartreuse being moderated by the gin. It takes that chartreuse, that punch, that black pepper, that honey, those herbs, and it lengthens it out across the flavor profile of your gin, which is, you know, standard gin, a little bit of citrus, obviously juniper. The twist of lime, it's just a touch of bitterness. It actually almost contributes more to the mouthfeel than the flavor profile. But of course it is a component of the flavor profile from the nose of the drink, everything like that. It is, I like this one a lot. There's a roundness to this flavor profile and an evolution where you get this dance and interplay between the honey notes of yellow chartreuse, of course the herbs, which are tough to unpack in chartreuse, but I always get black pepper, and the juniper of the gin, where it's like, they're kind of, almost like a, this is my brain goes here, it's oscillating like a clock reaction. And this is like, it really, really, really works um, for such a simple thing. It's rare in my experience to find something this simple that works, and it does. I like that a lot. Really quickly too, you know, this drink uses the yellow chartreuse. I've got green chartreuse out too, because that's coming up in this next drink. You know, the difference between the two, they don't tell you much. The suspicion is that there's honey in here. Yellow is sweetened with honey, and it's maybe a slightly different blend of herbs and spices, but at the very least, it expresses a lot differently. It's a little less herbal, a little bit more mild, a little bit sweeter. Up next, I'm gonna make a drink called the Emerald Valley, uh, right after this. So I'm gonna make a drink called the Emerald Valley made in the game with a spirit distilled by Chantry sisters from over 70 herbs and flowers topped with an egg white and nutmeg. This drink is almost certainly some kind of a chartreuse sour and also it sounds amazing. Now I have to assume this menu isn't uh, actually including every single ingredient. It is common to these kinds of things, these menus to skip simple syrup for example because there's no way to make a sour without some citrus and some sugar and there's really no way to get a proper egg white topped drink without it at least being a cousin to a sour. So in my shaker, I'm gonna start with three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, which is buried back here because we have every ingredient under the sun on this one. Uh, okay, three quarters of an ounce. Then now I want one ounce of lime juice. This lime is cut kind of sideways for juicing, but I think we can manage it. One ounce of lime juice. Next, I'm gonna add two ounces of chartreuse. Um, and honestly, there are a few other spirits that could maybe serve in stand-ins for this game's description, but with the drink being called an Emerald Valley, I think chartreuse is the obvious choice, especially when they talk about the Chantry sisters making it from all those herbs and everything like that. I mean, come on, it sounds like chartreuse. Two ounces of chartreuse. Now I wanna add my egg white. I'm gonna dry shake this. I'm gonna add some ice to that. Grab yourself a sour glass. Strain that away. Chartreuse shakes out a little bit paler 
than I think I would have loved this to have been for something called an Emerald Valley. Um, you know, you could add a quarter ounce of Midori, maybe even split your lime with Midori and get this way greener. Not called for in the recipe. I wanna make it work as written, so I did not do that. And uh, now I'm gonna grate some fresh nutmeg over the top. But if you wanna try it with Midori, I'd love to hear how that goes. And there it is, the Emerald Valley. I am very excited to see how this one came out. Mm. Ooh, that is a delight. What a wonderful texture. The whole experience is one of puckering your mouth. It has this tart, very, I mean, it's all chartreuse. The spices and herbs of the chartreuse with the, the texture of the egg white with the sweetness and the lime juice are so pleasant. Wow, does that work really good in a sour. I mean, like incredibly good in a sour. This is wonderful. I'm getting a note of grapes in there, like, Fresh grapes, sage, maybe I'm, I'm tasting. Maybe that's rosemary. Very interesting, savory herbal flavors, but then they're paired with this sweet and sour thing. They express so well. And then with the texture of the egg white and then actually the garnish of the nutmeg really is super duper nice here. It's very experiential. I mean, it makes you sweat. It makes your mouth salivate. It puckers the inside of your mouth. I mean, loud flavors, loud flavors. I love this. It may not be for everybody's palate. I love this though. Next up, I wanna move on to another drink called the Randy Dowager. Right, after this. This is a Randy old broad, that Dowager. <laughs> the Randy Dowager, the, the horny old lady. Uh, this game really is just what if romance novels were a video game, isn't it? That's what all you are doing, by the way, out there. You're just. You don't really even, nobody really plays this game. You just fantasize about different characters, fucking different characters. That's, I don't get it. I don't, that's not, that's not video gaming to me. I'm just an old ass millennial. But y'all, you wanna play through this game 10, 20 times in a row and imagine this one with that one and that one and this one. You do your thing, that's fine. I think that's fine. I don't get it. It's okay. You got your thing going on, it's fine. I'm not gonna get it, but I can accept it. And I can appreciate it, that's fine. Anyway, whatever, because Granny's got as much the right to get it as anyone else, so let's do it. Let's fall in love. Uh, this drink is described as a tall glass of abyssal peach liqueur. I did not realize they enjoyed that in hell, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense, certainly. Fresh cream garnished with sugar rose petals served on a silk handkerchief that's got a scandalous rhyming couplet written by the bartender at uh, it's awfully specific. All right, look, I've thought a lot about this drink and based on the description, the tall glass, the fresh cream, I think it's gonna be like a peach variation on a Ramos gin fizz. And to make that, I'm going to start by chilling my glass. It helps a lot with this one. It's a best practice to chill your glass for every drink. I don't do it on the show because there's a continuity problem with it, for the, uh, to be perfectly honest. However, I would encourage you to do so. So now I'm gonna take my shaker and I'm going to add to this a quarter ounce of simple syrup. Quarter ounce of simple syrup, here we go. I want half an ounce of lemon juice. Now I want half an ounce of lime juice. We're getting that double whammy here. Half an ounce of lime juice. For the spirit, I want one and a half ounces of peach eau de vie. I'm going to use this um, orchard peach. This is very tasty stuff. It tastes pretty darn peachy. It is also made from distilled peaches. Uh, now I wanna add one ounce of heavy cream. And now I need one egg white. And now I'm gonna dry shake this, and I'm gonna dry shake the heck out of this. Uh, I wanna dry shake this kind of a lot because we're going for something akin to, to a Ramos Gin Fizz, okay? And actually, I'm gonna go one step further. I'm gonna take the spring off. I'm gonna take the spring off of my Hawthorne strainer and throw it into my shaker. You know, people always point out to me, hey, 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 you know, you can do that, right? I'm like, yeah, I know I can do that. It's not necessary usually. Here, maybe it'll help us a little bit. I don't know, I don't know, it's worth a shot, okay? So it's pretty thick in here now. Now I'm gonna add my ice. And I'm gonna shake the living hell out of this for a long time. Hopefully that's enough, we're gonna find out. I'm gonna take my cold glass and I'm going to actually add a little seltzer first. And now I am ready to strain. Ooh, 
we want to let that sit a little bit for a couple of seconds here. We want to let it set, maybe even a minute. Get my straw ready here. Strix says it should be garnished with sugared rose petals. I tried to make some sugared rose petals. I didn't do so good, but this is a perfectly edible sugared rose. This is as close as I got. Put that right in your drink there. That really isn't bad looking, is it? So to make these, I just took a, a bowl, a little egg white. I whipped it just quickly, and then I dipped my roses in the egg white, and then I rolled them in the sugar, and I dried them in an oven. Anyway, there it is. Oh, the filthy, dirty rhyming couplet on a silk handkerchief. Well, I don't have a silk handkerchief, but I will leave the bartender's rhyming couplet in the pinned comment below. How does that suit you? Is that all right? Here we go with a randy dowager. Ooh. Mmm. Mmm. It's a delicious, airy, creamy peach milkshake. It is peach. It is peach all the way through. This is the taste of peaches in a light, airy, froth, delicious drink. Mmm. And you take a little bite of rose with it. Okay. Because they're edible. Now that combination is something really cool. Well, if you're eating the rose while you drink the peach, the combination of the sweet rose with the peach booze shake is very nice. It is a little bit tart and balanced with sweetness. It is very peachy. It tastes like peaches and air and froth and cream and mirth. This drink makes perfect sense to be called the Vrandi Dowager. Mmm. I'm all aflutter. I do declare you're giving me the vapors. The Dowager is Randy. Let's move on to the next drink. The final drink in today's episode right after this. Now I went out of order just slightly there because I felt like this one should be a nightcap drink, right? Cause this was like not the last drink in the list of drinks, but I put it last. It's called a night of shame. <laughs> I think we've all had one or two of those. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> not me, I've never had a night of shame. There's not much to this at all, but it honestly sounds delicious. Very simple to make. Get that glass very cold. I'm gonna pull it out of the freezer now and pour it, do it some port, like uh, Sandeman Founders Reserve uh, Ruby Port. This was the sweetest port I could lay hands to for this episode, but it is pretty sweet. Mm. Add to it a couple dashes of cocoa bitters. I am genuinely a huge fan of Angostura's cocoa bitters, and I think that they will work particularly well here. And a twist of orange. And there it is, a night of shame. Perfect for enjoying with any randy dowagers you go home with. Let's give it a try and uh, see how it was. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's great. The combination of the orange twist with the cocoa bitters on the ruby port makes this very, very tasty. The problem with it is, is that it's almost there. You want this. This is right on the cusp of being like a mulled wine or a smoking bishop or something you would have at Christmas in a big hot bowl. But this is very nice. You know, this is a lovely nightcap kind of thing, you know, to sit down by the fire and enjoy with your dowager friend. You get the orange up front because it's sitting across the top of the drink and then you get this wine note, this nice sweet red wine. And then the chocolate, the cocoa bitters is kind of there as a baseline, super tasty, easy to drink. I think a sweeter port would be even better, but this is the port I have. You know, I gotta say, one of the very fun things about this episode was that all of these recipes were written up pretty much exactly like this in the game. I mean, they were all I mean, there's some interpretation, but there's not really any modifications being made here. Who wrote that little piece of lore? That was a doozy. All of these were excellent. I, I really didn't do much from what you wrote in the game. Uh, made some guesses. That's about it. But these were all excellent, very drinkable drinks straight out of a video game. So, I mean, there's something. That's fun. That's unusual. Usually with this kind of stuff, you know, when I'm adapting fantasy stuff, when I'm doing video game stuff, I have to get very wild and, and, and branch out. So I go, this is kind of easy. I like it. I like doing the easy stuff. It's easy. It's very good. My favorite of these was the Emerald Valley. I really enjoyed this one. Mm. But they were all really good. Um, super fun. I'm on Twitter at How to Drink. I'm on Instagram at How to Drink. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. You'll find me on Twitch occasionally at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. I've been making this show for a really long time. I'd love to hear from you about other video games you want me to adapt. But in the meantime, check out some of these other episodes from the back catalog of How to Drink. And I'll just be standing here enjoying, and I do mean enjoying, this Randy Dowager. She is just divine. <laughs>